and welcome. My name is Sophia and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Charlotte Bismuth's newest title, Bad Medicine, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Charlotte Bismuth for the launch of her newest book, Bad Medicine. Charlotte Bismuth started her legal career at the firm of Debevoise and Plimpton LLP and joined the New York County District Attorney's Office in 2008 as an appellate attorney. In 2010, she transferred into the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, which prosecutes felony narcotics crimes within the city's five boroughs. After her work on the landmark manslaughter prosecution of Dr. Stan Lee, she left the DA's office to advocate for victims of the opioid epidemic. In partnership with activists, grieving families, academics, journalists, and physicians, Bismuth has called for accountability from Purdue Pharma and other entities responsible for launching the opioid epidemic. Charlotte also serves as a consultant for the Prosecutor's Center for Excellence, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting best practices in prosecution. She's a graduate of Columbia University, Columbia Law School, and the Institute for Political Science in Paris. She lives in New York City with her husband and children. Joining Charlotte in conversation is Patricia McCormick. Patricia, a two-time National Book Award finalist, is the author of several critically acclaimed novels, including Never Fall Down, the true story of a boy who survived the killing fields of Cambodia by playing music for the Khmer Rouge, and Sold, a moving account of sexual trafficking that was adapted into a feature film in 2016. She's also the co-author of I Am Malala, the story of Malala Yousafzai, the girl who was shot by the Taliban in her fight for education. Her book, The Plot to Kill Hitler, was published in 2016. Her first picture book, Sergeant Reckless, The True Story of the Little Horse Who Became a Hero, came out in 2017. She attended Rosemount College, the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and has an MFA from the New School. She lives in New York. So, without further ado, please welcome Charlotte Bismuth and Patricia McCormick to the stage. I'm Charlotte. And I'm Patty. <laughs> we wanted to start off just by acknowledging that um, the action is not just on the screen with us, but in the audience tonight, you are surrounded by people who made a very, very big difference in the lives of others. Um, the book is a story from the front lines of the opioid epidemic. There's a young man named Matt Dingo among us who was the person who reported Dr. Lee to the police. He saved many lives. Um, and I just want to acknowledge his contribution tonight. I also see that my partners, um, Stephanie Santosario, Investigator Joe Hall, Senior Trial Counsel Peter Kugasian are here and I thank them and all the court reporters and all of you for coming. Because this was a case that resulted in so much loss of life, Patty and I would like to start with a short moment of reflection. I've written out the names of a few of the victims from this case, but of course I know that we all have others in minds, uh, in our minds and in our hearts, and so we can take a few moments to think about them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight to help you launch this wonderful book. Um, I am someone who nearly lost someone to the op opioid epidemic, so I'm great, grateful to you, uh, as are many people who are here tonight. Thank you. I met Charlotte at uh, a reading that Walter Kern was giving and I instantly knew that she was a writer. She's a very talented and tenacious prosecutor as well, but I could tell that the soul of a writer lived in her. And so I'm very happy to see that this book has come to fruition. Um, 
I also had the honor of seeing her in court. I was so intrigued by the story that she was pursuing or the case that she was pursuing that I went to see her in court. And so uh, I can picture many of the, the scenes that are they're in this story and uh, saw her uh, doing her finest work there. So as many of you know, I know that many of the people in the audience uh, are familiar with the book, are, have been part of the investigation, uh, had family and loved ones who were involved in this uh, case. But for those of you who may not know, it is a wonderful page turning uh, legal thriller about a, uh, a dirty doctor who ran a pill lab uh, that resulted in the deaths of many people. And Charlotte and her uh, team pursued him, starting with just a, a tip that came in on a post-it note uh, and really made uh, legal history in prosecuting uh, this doctor for homicide. So Charlotte, I wonder if you'll just start at that moment of receiving the tip. I know that you mentioned that the tipster uh, is with us tonight and has allowed you to make his name public for the first time. But I wonder if you just talk about when the first uh, the case first came to you. Thank you. And, and yes, I should have mentioned that um, I do have his permission tonight to reveal his name, which is a uh, pseudonym in the book, the name of Eddie Valora in the book. Um, so in 2010, I was a relatively junior prosecutor at the office of the special narcotics prosecutor, and we received a tip. My office had been noticing a significant and concerning uptick in prescription drug crimes. Um, and that night, my boss uh, handed me a little note with a detective's name, a doctor's name, and an address on 49th Street in um, Queens. Now, she said that the tipster had said only that this was a doctor who was prescribing medications to kids who didn't need them. And of course, it was serious enough to have been reported, but also as a prosecutor's office, we didn't know whether we were the right ones to handle the case because doctors prescribe medications. That is what they do. So um, for the first few weeks, I did background research on Dr. Lee, whose name had been on that post-it. I was lucky enough to have senior investigator Joe Hall, a veter veteran NYPD homicide detective, come on the case when we were having trouble uh, having access to the complainant. And Joe Hall, through his incredible detective work, was able to track down uh, the brave young man and bring him in for a conversation with us. And it was at that point that we understood that we might be dealing with a very unique situation. A doctor who had a sign up in his office on which he advertised the price of his services per pill per prescription uh, with extra fees if you came early, with extra fees if you were also receiving controlled substances from other doctors. A doctor who didn't care about his patients suffering in the sense that he, he didn't investigate their pain, he didn't send them out for diagnostic tests. All he did was write a prescription, ask for the money, and as so many patients said over so many years that followed, he took that money and put it in the pocket of his white coat. So on that night, with that little post-it note, I really had no idea, not just that the case would end up changing my life, but um, you know, thanks to the complainant, it would end up saving lives and bringing some measure of closure to families who were really in a tremendous amount of suffering after their loss, the loss of their loved ones, thinking that they had been the ones to fail. Mm -hmm. That's an important uh, point that I wanted to pick up on the the role of the loved ones in helping you see this case through and your connection with them and the way in which you kept their concerns front and center at all times to be aware of the real human victims of this case. You know, the from the very beginning, the case was about human beings and human suffering. Dr. Lee, of course, ultimately at trial twisted that to say that, you know, he had been deceived by patients who were lying to him, who were saying that they were in pain. But the real pain was 
was among those patients and those families who had been either seeking a legitimate physician who would help them with their conditions or who had been suffering from opioid use disorder and uh, you know, were, were visibly distressed, visibly requiring assistance or referral, and Dr. Lee monetized their suffering. So when we realized that human beings, you know, patients had been betrayed by a physician and that the families actually, in some cases, knew quite a bit because they knew that their loved one, their child or their father or their sister was seeing a doctor and they felt in trust because of that. And I, I think specifically of Joseph Haig's sister who told us, um, you know, he was seeing a doctor, so it was okay. Joseph Haig himself in his final moments wrote a note to his family in which he said, I haven't used illegal drugs in years. So there was this, you know, this profound betrayal at work and it became really, really crucial to us to connect with the patients, with the survivors, with the families and have them come forward and have them tell the jury what they had seen and, uh, you know, that this was actually really about a man driven by greed. Mm -hmm. I remember in the book uh, that you kept a picture of uh, one of the victims and maybe others, but I know that you kept one uh, on your desk as the investigation started. Um, I actually had a photo of uh, a young man named Nicholas Rappold who passed away at the age of 21. And on the day of um, the opening statement, I was petrified, beyond petrified, um, especially because the beginning of the trial had been put off, you know, from one day to the next to the next. And I just wanted to remind myself of why we were there. I think anybody who has considered becoming a prosecutor or who has served in that role knows that, uh, you know, serving the victims, especially the ones who cannot speak for themselves is really a sacred duty. And for me to have uh, the face of Nicholas Rappold, whose life was interrupted, um, whose mother had become a very important person in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that reminded me of why we were there. And it allowed me to overcome the, well, maybe not overcome, I won't lie. I didn't overcome the nerves, but to push through. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a letter that was sent by one of the families um, to Dr. Lee. This letter is in regards to our daughter and your patient, as she is in very bad shape, both mentally and physically as well. Please, you must stop prescribing these deadly doses of drugs, ranging from methadone to you name it. She is one foot away from a serious OD. What was it like to meet Dr. Lee for the first time? Well, after reading those patient files and reading that letter and notes, recording his conversations with other parents, um, when I first saw him on the day of arraignment, uh, it was a relief to know that we had shut down his clinic. That was in November, 2011. We also knew it was the beginning of a long journey because we still had so much work to do to trace back the criminal conduct and capture it um, you know, through the actions of another grand jury. Uh, but I think, you know, I think I can safely speak for my trial partner, Peter Kugasian, and for Joe Hall and everybody else who worked on the case that it was an enduring mystery to know how he had come to sit in front of these men and women and write out those prescriptions and take that cash and even have the, you know, the presence of mind to require the extra, uh, the extra $50 when they had strayed from his path. It's something I won't understand ever. And, you know, sadly, we learned recently that Dr. Lee had died in prison of COVID. And of course, um, I know that everyone who worked on the case uh, feels that you know nobody deserves a lonely and isolated death, and I think it also points out you know the um, the fact that we will never know. Uh, but with respect to the letter that you read, that letter shockingly had been submitted to Dr. Lee in 2007, mm -hmm. and we found it in the patient files in 2011. 
And not only had Dr. Lee continued to prescribe and sell prescriptions after that date, but he continued to prescribe the very medications that those parents were begging him to stop. And you describe a really shabby operation, a shabby place. Um, as you said, the, the prices are posted on the walls, almost like um, sandwich prices at a deli. Um, can you talk about the really the long painstaking process that you and the investigators and your partner went through to make sure you had the case that you wanted to, to bring? I think uh, everyone from the team who is on uh, this crowdcast right now is probably having flashbacks to a lot of very long heated debates, uh, very long meetings in conference rooms, um, sessions, you know, going through 1,200 patient files page by page, reading them on our own, reading them to each other, escalating them to our supervisors. Uh, we had a, an incredible consultant on the homicide front, Nancy Ryan, who had served as Mr. Morgenthau's uh, right-hand woman as um, chief of the trial division. She came in to really vet the homicide cases and uh, educate us about what would be required. Um, it was it was very tough and it was daunting because, you know, of course you want to bring charges that capture the criminal conduct, but at the same time you don't want to overreach and endanger the case. So uh, it involved a lot of legal research. We, um, you know, the the letter that you read again. We combed through the patient files and we were looking for a couple of things. We were looking for patients who had. Uh, whose vulnerability had been visible or known to Dr. Lee, meaning that their, maybe their physicians had called Dr. Lee, as in the case of Michael Cornetta, whose uh, emergency room psychiatrist called Dr. Lee and said, your patient is in the ER in an overdose. And yet Dr. Lee continued to prescribe. Patients who, uh, like Nicholas Rappold, had only been a few times to see Dr. Lee with a bare bones complaint of pain you know, and with sometimes months going between visits, who, whom Dr. Lee knew were getting substances from other doctors, and yet he continued to prescribe. So gradually we built up this filtering process where even though there was a, you know, a tremendous universe of harm, I mean, he had over 1,200 patients. We learned of 16 patients who had died of overdoses, either while under his care or within a year of leaving his practice. But we had to filter it down. And we gradually brought it down to 20 patients. We presented evidence to a grand jury. There were, um, I can't remember the exact number of grand juries, but over a dozen men and women who came in and heard a case over a period of six months um, heard evidence and voted on 218 charges against Dr. Lee, including two counts of homicide. Charlotte, was there one moment uh, where you really caught an incredible break in the case and things turned? Or conversely, was there one or maybe more moments where you thought, not going to happen? I would say on the latter, that was pretty much every minute of every day, <clears throat> pardon me, for four years, uh, we felt that we were walking a tightrope. Um, you know, it was such a broad and complex case. So just trying to keep track of all the medical records um, and all the patients and all the, you know, the testimony was difficult, but uh, there were breaks in the case and those breaks came in part um, because of that sort of you know, obsessive work that we were doing. So I remember one day, I believe it was in 2012, when Joe Hall and I were in a conference room on the investigator's floor. So it's sort of this big conference room. It's a little bit dusty. Joe, you should know that. Um, and we had been in there for hours. We had in front of us um, boxes and boxes of materials that had been seized from Dr. Lee's home in New Jersey. And so we were going through really page by page. We were going through receipts. We were going through, he kept ledgers um, with the names of every patient who had seen him on every day that he was open and the amount of money that they had paid him. And then at one point we came across a yellow folder. And in that yellow folder, there were a couple of loose sheets that were of the same format 
as Dr. Lee's patient files. And so Joe and I were sort of puzzled as to why they had been in New Jersey, why they weren't with the file that they belonged to. And in, you know, as often happened when I was working with Joe, we would sort of look at each other and then he would run off to, he ran off to the locker to grab the patient files that belonged to those sheets and we compared them. And in that moment, we realized that Dr. Lee had falsified some of his patient records. And why did this matter? It mattered because those patients were, his treatment of those particular patients was under scrutiny by the state administrative board. And so we had consciousness of guilt. We had an awareness that not only his records were inadequate, but that his practice was inadequate and that it was criminal and that it was hurting them. Um, and so that moment, I think, was a real turning point because we knew that it had been about the money, but to have this very compelling evidence of Dr. Lee's lack of credibility not only made us feel like we were on the right track, but we knew that that was important evidence to present to a grand jury and to a trial. And I would add that, you know, um, these moments which are portrayed in Hollywood and they sort of happen and then everything's fine. That's not how it happens in reality. And Peter Kugation would tell you that he then spent, I would say, easily dozens of hours painstakingly comparing every sheet of paper in each of the 20 patient files for each of the victims whom we brought up at trial to make sure that there were no differences and to show the jury the extent of the falsification. So, you know, it, it was a couple of hours of testimony at trial and behind that, there was so much work by Peter and the witness in preparing for that moment. And I do think that it made a big difference to the jury. Um, I remember reading, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, that the DEA had already come to talk to him or to warn him. Were there other, and you mentioned the state as well, what failed? to catch him before this point? Um, I'm inclined to say everything. At the same time, he did a very, very good job of keeping up the facade. Dr. Lee, uh, when he was confronted by the DA in 2009, assured them that he was conducting full exams for every patient. Um, on, in the few occasions when he was asked for patient files, for instance, when the state oversight agency contacted him, or on one occasion, even when a medical examiner contacted him, he falsified the records. He also had, you know, a full-time job in a very well-respected hospital in New Jersey. There were no complaints. He was a very well-qualified doctor with excellent credentials. He was an anesthesiologist. So if he knew how to do anything, it was to bring people into a state of unconsciousness and then safely bring them back. So, you know, in addition to everything else, he enjoyed the privilege of uh, his status. He enjoyed the trust of the DEA and of society. And I think that is what allowed him to continue exploiting the pain of his patients for so long. Mm -hmm. This is also very much a story of your, the team, the people that you worked with, and in particular, your relationship with your colleague, Peter. Um, can you talk about the many miles that the two of you have traveled? Yes. Uh, Peter, uh, who has heard, uh, who heard an early draft of the book, was kind enough and, um, you know, unsurprisingly uh, for his character, sort of brave enough to tell me, and this is explicit, literally what he told me, you have, um, you are allowed to talk about the difficulties that we had. And that meant so much because I think that, you know, the level of respect and friendship that I have for Peter now um, comes not only from having been in the trenches together with Joe, with Stephanie, with all the brave witnesses who came forward, but it also comes from having had to, you know, butt heads a little bit and then talk about it. Um, we had a remarkable number of very awkward discussions during, you know, the preparation for the trial and the trial where we would just say, well, you know, why can't we agree on anything? And the fact is that 
we did have a lot of disagreements, but our styles were so complementary. Um, I tended to sort of overstretch beyond what was absolutely necessary to prove the case. And Peter, who had actually tried not just a few homicides before, but many homicides before, would bring me back and tell, you know, this is what we need to focus on. This is what really matters. And that is absolutely essential. Um, and so to have his blessing to tell the truth about what a productive working relationship is like, what does it mean to, you know, to really go through a, um, a test of endurance, you know, like that uh, was very meaningful. And also, you know, I went to um, read the book to Peter and inevitably there would be, you know, either his son or um, somebody else, you know, meaningful to him there with us. And so I knew that, you know, um, it was just a, an incredible experience to read it to him and have his feedback and also have somebody else there to uh, respond. It was, it was like being in the editing room, but for a book. Mm -hmm. And you have developed a real uh, friendship out of this in the end. From my part, yes. I hope Peter would agree. <laughs> um, Charlotte, you also bear a lot of yourself in the book. The narrative of your own life runs parallel to the narrative of the case. And I can't imagine that that was easy to be as honest as you were. Can you talk about that decision a little bit? Yes. First, I will avoid that question by saying that, um, you know, it, the story is not just about the friendship with Peter, but my tremendous respect for him and Joe Hall and the amount of work that they did. I mean, I knew that I obsessed over the case, but they also brought, you know, decades of experience. So working with the two of them was transformative and it actually really, really helped me deal with what was happening in my life because I was learning how to channel it. Um, yes, it was terrifying to talk about the personal aspects, but again, I've come to believe that it's really important to sort of lift the curtain on the reality of prosecution, the reality of crime, uh, the reality of the so-called work-life balance, which I think is, a, you know, as one friend said, there's no work-life balance, just work-life choices. And uh, it was hard. I asked my children if it was okay with them. Uh, they set certain limits. I respected those limits. And as for the depression and anxiety, I think um, I have come to understand a lot about the stigma attached not just to opioid use disorder, but also to mental health issues. And I think that there is a real struggle to conform to expectations that uh, needs to be discussed. And it would have been such a relief to me to know that others were experiencing the same thing. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've received so many heartfelt messages from my team members um, about it now. And the, the fact is that working with them changed everything. For me as a reader, it made me feel uh, much closer to you and therefore uh, more trusting of everything that you said because you were willing to be honest about the stress and strain of your job, what was happening in your marriage. So I'm happy to hear you have, you've gotten feedback from other readers that that's been a meaningful piece of the book to them. It, it, I think that especially for young professionals, um, the messages that I've gotten are that, you know, they, they have felt these things, but never said them. And, you know, obviously, of course, one of the other uh, themes of the book is that, you know, I, um, I may have ex been experiencing difficulty, but the families and victims that I was working with were not just still struggling with the aftermath of Dr. Lee, but they were brave enough to come forward. So whatever I was experiencing, you know, being nervous on the first day or trying to, you know, put this case together and get my documents in order was absolutely nothing compared to what we were asking of them. What we were asking of them was to come forward and tell a grand jury and then a jury uh, about their past, about their struggles, 
even about the fact that they may have told Dr. Lee, you know, lies in order to have him prescribe more and asking a jury to believe them and then subjecting themselves to cross-examination, which, um, you know, I think uh, in the case of one young woman, Michael Cornetta's girlfriend, really resulted in terrible pain because Dr. Lee's defense attorney confronted her with the fact that her own physician had been prescribing her boyfriend, in addition to Dr. Lee, a separate physician who treated her, had been prescribing her boyfriend just a staggering number of pills, and she collapsed. Um, the judge became very, very angry in that moment. He... Uh, I think, you know, felt that it had been unnecessary to call her to this, to call her to the stand. That had been a very difficult decision. You know, we all had a very hard time after that day, but, um, you know, ultimately she said that it had been important for her to do it. And unanimously, the witnesses felt that they had made a difference and they really did. They saved lives by telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlotte, it was really a pleasure to see you in the courtroom and to see you as an attorney. Um, I'm curious about the writer part of your identity as well. Um, it's your first book. And it's very well done. And you employed a very uh, ambitious, I think, structure going back and forth in time. It might have been easier, especially if you're somebody who's used to building a legal brief to do things in order or do things chronologically. I loved that because I thought it built a lot of tension. Can you talk about um, the writing process and how you made that choice? Yes, though I think that compliment should be accepted not by me, but by Jessica Dulong, who is in the audience tonight and who is an extraordinary editor who worked with me um, on the final drafts of the book, actually semi-final to, well, many, many drafts of the book. And uh, she kept telling me, you have to trust your reader. And you're absolutely right. I had a tendency um, that, you know, my colleagues, uh, Nancy Bryan and Peter Kugation had called out before, which was to want to do this sort of exhaustive layout. Um, and it was unnecessary. And they would both take my my motions or whatever I was writing and then sort of bring them down to the essential. And we had this an incredibly rigorous editing process. And Jessica did the same as did my editor, Julia Heifetz, um, with the uh, with the book. And, you know, she really felt and I have to agree that it was a way to allow the reader to experience the parallel between building the case and my life and also it, as a prosecutor, you you don't get the pieces in order. And um, I also wanted to think about that, that moment in time when my life intersected with Dr. Lee, which was the moment of arraignment in November 2011. And I was thinking about what had been happening that I didn't know about before. What was I experiencing? And then how that intersection changed everything. So it was sort of an X structure, if you will. But um, Jessica really taught me how to let go of that sort of perfectionism and focus on the moments that expressed the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you told me that the, uh, the red pen edit treatment that you'd gotten on your briefs also helped you to develop a sense for um, how good it is to be edited. It's painful, but how it makes the final product so much better. A team makes everything better. I always thought that I had to go it alone. A team makes everything better. It can be, you know, it can be uh, a challenge to learn how to work with a team, how to delegate, but especially when you're fortunate enough as I am to work, as I was to work not only with people who had a tremendous amount of experience, but with people who had incredibly powerful brains and instincts like Stephanie Santosario and others, um, you know, John Courtney, um, and under the leadership of Bridget Brennan, who just had a lot of guts in confronting the opioid epidemic and going after the doctors. So on my own, I wouldn't have done any of this. And I think none of the people in the book 
um, and in life would have been able to reach the point of accountability for Dr. Lee if we hadn't worked together. How and when did you know it was a book? in addition to being a case, that you needed to not only um, prosecute the individual, but that you needed to uh, create a record and a document and a drama uh, about it? I felt that the trial had been the book. You know, telling, building a case for trial is very similar in some ways to writing a book. When the trial was over, uh, I remember Joe Hall and I stepping out into the street and looking at each other and thinking, you know, so now what? Um, we can't believe it's over. And the fact is that it had been such an intense experience for everyone involved that, uh, you know, other than doing what we had to do to prepare the case for appeals or whatever might come next, we didn't really talk about it and I didn't want to write about it. Um, I wrote actually a very bad novel before I wrote the book and then realized that um, my husband, who had been telling me for years that this was the story that I should write, you know, maybe had a point. So mm -hmm. I have to credit him for that. Mm -hmm. And what are you working on now? I'm working on a couple things. I, um, I've been following the Purdue bankruptcy and working with uh, Sackler Payne, which is an incredible advocacy group founded by the photographer Nan Golden, um, who is fighting for accountability at the national level with members of the Sackler family in Purdue. So I have actually started drawing cartoons related to the bankruptcy as a way of communicating uh, what's going on in a more user-friendly manner. And so I, I think I might try to do something there, maybe a graphic novel of sorts in partnership with some experts. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a couple of other books that I'm thinking of. The, the beauty of being a writer rather than an attorney for me is that I feel more freedom to draw on every other part of my life. And I think that there are some attorneys um, like Bridget, like Peter, who are able to bring that into their work. But for me, writing about the law, translating the jargon, translating the procedure is much more my calling, even though I really miss the investigations. Gotcha. Is there anything left undone or left unsaid if you could you know, put an epilogue in the book or if there was more that you would want readers to know, what would it be today? Well, I would like to give a voice, a direct voice to the uh, families who were involved. And you know, for them, if they feel inclined to tell the story from their perspective. And I think also, you know, one thing that really bothers me is we have lost nearly 500,000 lives in the opioid epidemic. It is unspeakable. And there hasn't been any mourning, any grieving on a collective level. You know, we hear stories individually. And one of the things that really, you know, was both difficult and um, incredible working on the book was that everybody I ran into would say, well, you know, I also know someone. Yeah. And that's, that's traumatizing for us as a country. And I think we have to face that and deal with it and talk about it. And um, so I, I would like to hear everybody's stories. And I would like to hear stories of people who are fighting back. And I would like to draw attention to you know, the legal proceedings where we have a chance of getting accountability, such as the Purdue bankruptcy, such as hopefully criminal prosecution. So you and your colleagues notched a win in, in a, uh, an epidemic or a world that we don't very often see wins. We don't very often see um, accountability. Um, do you think that the epidemic is on the wane? No. We, unfortunately, uh, the CDC recently re released um, statistics showing that in the 12 months between May 2019 and May 2020, 81,000 people had lost their lives to overdoses, which far outpaced the 12 preceding months. I think that the combination of the COVID epidemic and the pandemic has led to 
a horrific sense of isolation has led to the reduction of harm uh, reduction efforts. I mean, the you know, um, mm -hmm. many of those prog programs, I think, were already in danger because of stigma mm -hmm. and sort of a not in my backyard, um, you know, lobbying effort. But uh, if we need anything right now, we need to just help keep people stay alive, give them a chance to stay alive until they are able to pick a different path if that is what they want to do. Um, and, you know, I wish I, I never imagined that on the day that this book would come out or that this week that it would have gotten worse, but it has. Well, um, you know, if it means that there are other Dr. Lees out there and other people read this book, uh, it, it shows that the prosecution, the successful prosecution is possible. So thank you. So we'd like to open it up now to um, our audience to see what questions you have for Charlotte. There are a lot of excellent questions here. Thank you, everyone. Um, Firstly, how do you feel about modern criminal justice reforms and um, how they may impact criminal charges against medical professionals? Well, uh, one of there were a couple of changes made to the law in New York State during and after the Dr. Lee case. During the case, the iStop program was in, implemented, which um, created a system where doctors had to check whether their patients were receiving controlled substances from other physicians. And so that kind of forced visibility, forced transparency, accountability, um, I think is very important. The other changes that occurred were that um, some of the criminal statutes were changed to include pharmacists and physicians in the definition of um, certain crimes. And I think that's essential. You know, there can't be a bias built into the law that just because you've been to medical school you know, you can't sell a prescription or you can't be guilty of selling a prescription. Now, um, you know, I think that one of the biggest, I mean, there have been many doctor prosecutions and especially by the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor, which really, you know, um, focused on exposing the greed of dirty doctors and holding them accountable. But uh, we need to do that at a national level. We need to do that with the corporate executives who launched the opioid epidemic, those who have profited, you know, executives of distribution companies or, um, you know, other sort of systemic actors who really profited from the epidemic. They, they, can't, be, they can't be above the law. And some of the laws on the books, like reckless manslaughter, may well apply and they should, they should be pursued. Okay. Um, out of dark curiosity, do you have an idea of how Dr. Lee treated his non-cash cow patients? Did he practice decent medicine? Was he even vigilant about addiction potential? Um, with some who came to the to the Queens Clinic and he cashed in on the vulnerable. So whoever submitted that question is thinking like a prosecutor. And that is not just you know, a question of curiosity, but it's a crucial question because um, we were trying to understand his state of mind, his intent. We were trying to see you know, what in fact his clinic was about. What we learned was that even though there were no sales of highly addictive substances before a certain date, which was somewhere around 2007 or so, the patients he was seeing before then were vehicles for insurance fraud. So um, he was seeing a population of mostly elderly patients with you know, chronic pain conditions stemming from old age and, and illnesses. And he would double bill or he would otherwise falsify insurance records to maximize the amount of money that he was making. So we were able to um, present evidence of the scheme to defraud to the grand jury and I think that was a crucial part of the case because the jury saw that from the very beginning, there was a greed just driving um, this side hustle that he had on the weekend. Okay. Um, we have a question from Dawn. This book would make a great movie. Is that something you would be interested in pursuing at some point in the future? 
if it is the Don, I think it is, Don was one of the heroic court stenographers on the case who sat through hours of exhaustive testimony. I love court stenographers, thank you. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it can be a blessing and a curse to have a cinematic life. So um, right now my, you know, my purpose is to draw attention to the need for accountability and um, that's all I can speak to. Uh, this one's a little bit more personal. Um, who inspires you, Charlotte? Do you have a hero you look up to? I do. I would say Matt Dingo and Margaret Rappold, Aaron Kingsley Markovich, um, Kristen Haig, Jessica Dulong, Peter Kugasian, Joe Hall, Stephanie Santosario, Bridget Brennan. My heroes are the people who I have seen working so hard, putting one foot in front of the other through the impossible. And I think of them every day. And I also, you know, there's another young woman um, whose name is Andrea Howard in the book who uh, told Dr. Lee that um, her father had killed himself in front of her, that she wanted to kill herself. Uh, she was in such suffering, he pushed her to the brink and she agreed to testify. And when she testified, she held a stuffed animal in her arms. And after the trial, she gave it to me. So she's my hero. I'm not going to tear up. We're going to. I am. <laughs> she's one of the bravest people I've ever met. That's. She's my hero. That's incredibly brave. Um, we have a question from Jordan. Uh, thank you, Charlotte and Patricia, for doing this. Charlotte, you touched on this briefly, but I'm wondering if you can say more about your reaction to hearing about Lee's death. You gracefully cast it as undeserved, but did you struggle at all in coming to that conclusion about the man who, as you proved at trial, took lives? I didn't because um, he was sentenced to a term in prison. He was not sentenced to death. I am strongly opposed to the death penalty. I believe that those who are in the custody of the government uh, deserve to be protected and that, um, you know, he should have been able to serve his term and return to his family. And I, you know, having seen the pain of people who lost loved ones in an untimely manner and having seen the devastation of COVID, there, there wasn't a moment of hesitation. Okay, we've got a question from Callie. Um, Charlotte, you mentioned harm reduction. Could you speak about the policy implications of what you learned from the trial? So I have undergone a real uh, sea change with respect to um, opioid use disorder, you know, which I think many of us in the law enforcement community um, because the laws are written a certain way, are tend to see the, the criminality in that rather than uh, the medical disease. And I believe that um, if we recognize, as the medical community has, the legitimate medical community has, that addiction is an illness, then we have to reduce the suffering. So I believe not just that harm reduction should exist, but that it is an urgent need right now. Um, from what I've learned recently, it is much more painful to inject with a needle that has been used than it is not to. And addiction is already, you know, can already be a state of suffering. Why wouldn't we help? Why wouldn't we help keep people alive? There's also a family from the case who lost uh, their brother, who was a patient of Dr. Lee's. And subsequently they lost their son and their son died alone. He was young. There was fentanyl laced in uh, the substance that he was using. You know, harm reduction uh, can allow for safe injection sites, which I know are very controversial, but again, nobody wants people to die alone and unnecessarily. And I think we need to set aside some of our uh, thinking on that for those of us, you know, who uh, maybe, you know, struggle to accept it and, and just save lives. Um, 
What, if any, role did the judge's personality play in the trial? He kept us on a very tight rope. It was very hard for him, uh, I think, to, as it was for everyone, to keep track of all the witnesses, all the exhibits. We had 72 witnesses. The trial went over four months. And it wasn't just the victims and witnesses who would have had so much to lose if the case had turned into a mistrial, but the judge as well. Um, he really worked very, very hard. And I think that must have been an incredibly stressful experience. Um, and I appreciate the difficulty of what he had to do. I did think it was ironic that sometimes he would remark on our facial expressions because I was working so hard on my poker face, you know, but what can you do? Um, and I think we have time for one last question. Um, what do you think is a realistic outcome and perhaps separately a proper outcome on the Sackler lawsuits? Well, all of the Sackler lawsuits have been essentially frozen now because of the bankruptcy proceeding. I think that the members of the Sackler family should not be granted a release from civil immunity as a result of the bankruptcy. I think they should be criminally prosecuted. And uh, I think that the people who suffered should um, be able to recover. You know, they can't recover the lives and uh, the time that they have lost, but maybe they can have some financial compensation. And I fear that that is not the direction the bankruptcy is going in right now. Okay. Um, I think that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you, uh, both of you, for joining us tonight, for talking about these very heavy but very important topics that are really a part of our lives on a near daily basis. Um, thank you, our wonderful audience, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, is there anything either of you would like to say to our audience before we sign off for the night? Just thank you. Thank you for being here. And, uh, you know, I know that every one of you is trying to make a difference and it's working. So keep doing it. Thank you. And thank you, Sophia, for hosting. And thank you, Patty. It's my pleasure. It's also my pleasure. Um, if you haven't bought your copy already, there's a button at the bottom of your screen where you can purchase Bad Medicine. Um, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.